So there are plenty of easy explanations that you will hear for the changing patterns and climate and the fact that everything will balance out in the end. And we want to apply some data to those presumptions. And part of that data is applying measurements and data from, from the past and looking into some of the methods for how that's done. So let's look into that a bit. When we talk about these methods, some of you are exploring this for your final projects. We, a lot of the times we talk about core samples. Those can be from ice in ice flows uh, or in ice um, in um, glaciers. And they can, it can also be ice that is sea ice. It can be from lakes. It can be from the sediment at the bottom of the ocean. And it can be from coal beds, which are deep down in mines as well. And we can look for temperature profiles in these sediments and these, um, these materials. And we can also look for precipitation profiles, even atmospheric profiles and isotope profiles. We're going to go over all of that. And we can also look for methods that involve tree stumps or dendrochronology, and we can look for temperature and precipitation in those as well. Each of these methods has different strengths and weaknesses, so we're going to briefly go over that. For instance, when you look at isotope models, um, in, in many cases you're looking for instance, at coral. You hear isotope models being used for coral kind of quite a bit, and they are looking for what's called oxygen-18. Oxygen-18 is a heavier isotope of oxygen. Remember, when we talk about heavier isotopes, it means that there are additional neutrons on the, uh, on the oxygen. And that is rare in water, but it's there. And that heavier isotope tends to accumulate in cooler water. So if we look at oxygen isotopes in coral over decades, like you see there, if we see more oxygen 18 in some of those coral samples, and we can get it by spectroscopy, and now you understand why, um, spectroscopy will tell us a little bit more about the composition of of the chemicals in the substance. If we see car if we see oxygen 18 in some of those coral samples, especially when you see high oxygen, uh, excuse me, high um, um, oxygen 18 levels here, we are thinking that this is a cooler year, right around 1964, 1965. So when we see lower oxygen 18, we're thinking that it's a warmer year. This method has issues with it. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, and there have been problems with the method. Um, and ascertaining that the oxygen 18 is really demonstrating cooler water temperatures. So we often use this method along with other data to provide a story and put together an entire story. That's why we looked at the methods that you were looking at for your final project so closely. When we look, we were just looking at decades of research with um, oxygen isotopes. And you can look with a lot more for oxygen isotopes, but we're going by time here. Um, and so I wanted to look at hundreds of years next. You can look at something like dendrochronology, which is um, looking at tree stumps to find the climate hundreds of years ago. And this particular tree trunk, trunk is right uh, in line with the analysis of the data that's presented here. So in other words, we have the years on the independent axis, and we have departures from the median growth ring in the y-axis. So you know that a growth ring is dependent on temperature and on precipitation. So this could be a good sign of climate in those years when there is more growth due to favorable 
precipitation and temperature or less growth. And what you're noting here is that there, there probably was a mega drought in this area because the growth lines are so small. And there are other trees in the same area that are reporting the same mega drought. And we might have some information um, from other um, situations like explorers that were in the area that are reporting a mega drought in that time. So we look for information from all different areas before we make a judgment on climate. And dendrochronology can show us something that's hundreds of years old. Let's go a little bit deep, well, before we go there. There are problems with this method too. And some of the problems involve the fact that there might be another reason between, besides temperature or climate that this tree did not grow well. This tree could have had problems with uh, parasites or with bacteria or fungi or viruses during that time, and that's why it didn't grow well. So, like I said, these methods are not foolproof, um, and no method really is, so we like to combine it with other methods and other data. Now, that was hundreds of years old. Let's get down to thousands of years old. This is age along the y-axis at this time, which I don't love because I really want the independent axis to be on the x-axis. But it's a good study, despite its, it, despite its charts that I don't love. And what this is showing over thousands of years is a look at um, soil deposits and sediments and their pollen levels in order to determine the climate in the area at that time. They can do radioactive dating on the soil samples or they can do coring and once they go through that they can do the radioactive dating to make sure they have the years. And what they're finding is 14,000 years ago there was a lot more spruce pollen. Spruce really likes to be in a climate that is a little bit wetter and cer certainly cooler so that you can get an idea of the temperature and the precipitation at that time by using pollen data. These other um, grasses, and especially the ragweed, are in drier climates and warmer climates as well. So you can say from that core sediment of pollen that perhaps we are looking at a warming um, environment over the past 14,000 years. Now, soil, um, soil uh, um, cores are not the gold standard for a method because they can be impacted by a lot of um, animals and a lot of um, contamination of that period. So that in many cases, we might go back to deep ice caves where there may not be as much contamination by animals, certainly, and they haven't had a lot. Um, that has been a very, very um, continuous climate, probably for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So getting um, sediment samples out of an ice cave is a, is a better method for making sure you don't have contaminated um, samples. Ice cores. This is an ice core down here. It's very cool, right? And uh, I love to look at ice cores. I think they're really neat, especially when they track volcanic years and you see this black line in the volcanic years. It's very cool to see. Um, so these are often can go back to hundreds of thousands of years. And in fact, you note that on the x-axis here, year zero is here and you're going back in time approximately 450,000 years with these ice core datas. And you are looking at on the y-axis, you are looking at from top to bottom degrees Celsius off of a line that is matched to current temperatures. Okay, so the current temperature average in Celsius is the standard that we're basing this on. And we can look at parts per million of carbon dioxide 
and that is ranging from 180 parts per million to um, 300. And we can also look at dust concentration, which is definitely a part of the ice core, and parts per million of dust. Now, you will hear often on this that, well, it seems to, the data seem to show that the dust concentration actually increased first. And then that was followed by an increase in temperature. And then that was followed by an increase in carbon dioxide. And so it's not carbon dioxide driving temperature. It is actually temperature driving carbon dioxide. And you will hear this often. And again, this is a method issue that, um, that needs to be resolved, but it's coming to light that it's clearly a method issue. And I think my next slide goes into that. Yes, it does. So what they, what the current thinking in the scientific community is, it makes total sense that when you are looking at, and in this case, temperature is on the bottom. When you are looking at temperature here, you are looking at deuterium or what's called heavy hydrogen in the ice core, which is heavy hydrogen in water, much like the oxygen 18 was in the ocean water and trapped by the coral. In this case, heavy hydrogen is in the water. Um, it's, it produces um, um, what is known as heavy water for, in case you know it from World War II and bomb production. Um, it's, called, it's heavier density water that is going to be in the lower layers of ice. So it's heavier density. It's gonna be in the lower layers of ice for that. If you think about CO2, they are getting CO2 from the trapped air in the ice core. In other words, from the bubbles in the ice core. Well, what do we know? The, I, the bubbles in the ice core are definitely going to be a lighter density than the heavy hydrogen so that the CO2 is going for the same year is probably going to be up in the ice core relative to the heavier hydrogen in the water, which is more dense than the air anyway. So if you are looking at this, you may think, well, the CO2 changed later than the heavy hydrogen and the temperature. So therefore, the temperature must have changed first and the CO2 changed later. Well, no, I think we've got a method problem there. And this is some of the work that clearly, if you were interested in this field, you would be delving into quite a bit. Um, the same thing happens when they are analyzing airborne methane, because again, it's airborne, it's in the bubbles in the ice pack, so that it is generally less dense and higher up in the ice pack, but it's being mistaken for um, a time that is closer to our current time. So method issue. Um, but when we look at this, we are seeing that our CO2 level is increasing dramatically, regardless of ice cores. So let's go into that, and this is out of NASA, um, and, um, and let's go into that on the Climate changes in the past. I thought I had a new. Um, I had, thought I had a new video. Um, climate changes in the past. Yeah, I do have a new video. Okay, I can see on the other side. 